The TCM Plus Guild's new semi-legal drug farm had been under constant siege from reavers, pirates, slavers, and worst of all, interspecies homo crustio polycules, or the crab fuggers if you want the common name. How did the base remain standing amid all this? Well, turns out that reavers, pirates, slavers, and degenerates all hated each other just as much as whoever put that dirty great wall up across the foremost smuggling route in the region. The survivors from each group grappled with each other through the night after the main battle, and by about 3am, Jazz and her abuse-free crab companions crept down from the hills to be the last standing and claim victory. Not just victory. The equipment and supplies of all the invading armies now lay strewn around the riverbed, and corpse farmer extraordinaire Jazz got to harvesting. Further up river on that same night, Azumi and Sandor hauled Gustafsson and Ren into a tucked away United Cities farming colony. Unable to travel on in the pitch darkness, they hit the bar instead. Gustafsson and Ren were squirming about on hard beds upstairs, while the humans moped among the surprisingly busy tables in the main room. This is fucking shit, Izumi said once they were settled in. This is perfectly ordinary, Sandor said. This shit happens all the time outside the towns. That's how the cities get all their stuff. Yeah, this empire's a joke. True. Listen. Do you think the prince really will be able to change anything? I don't know. He really isn't like the other nobles, that much is true. But what are we meant to change if everything gets fucked up by a bunch of crab boys? If the empire was suitable for everyone, the crab boys wouldn't be a problem. Uh, I think crab boys are a problem in pretty much any context. Whatever. I mean, look at it this way. Our whole plan revolves around getting the emperor so baked that we can do whatever. You can escape any problem with enough drugs, they say. A man at a nearby table span around and leaned closer. Drugs, you say? He asked. Mind your business, Sandor growled back. The scrawny man stood and moved a little closer. Not planning on doing a little home growing, are ya? Fug, what, do you want a bribe to stay quiet? Not in the mood, shitface, Izumi said. Akron's grace. You need a good dose of drugs, that's for sure. Was just gonna say, if you're looking for someone who knows what to grow in these ear valleys, you need look no further, like. Arnold Foe's the name, grower and shower, green lady knower. Well, thanks. We're not growing green, but brown. Hard to explain. All a bit fugged up at the moment. Talk to me in the morning, Azumi said. So that's what two of the guild's four divisions were up to that night. As it happens, the stories of the third and fourth managed to converge. Nuke and his entourage were bringing all manner of junk back from Heft, including the vital chocolate beans in which the future of the entire empire surely lay. They had just reached Eyesocket, the United City's market on the edge of pirate territory, where they decided to take a break. To be more specific about the nature of this market, it was a regional center for slave trading. As such, the town was full of cages, dealerships, and hawkers. Get your scrubbers, one was calling. Finest second hand hands to hand over in a second. Discount if they don't have a second hand. Buy one hand and the second one's half off. Andy. Despite the masterful salesmanship, Nuke was peering at a hiver lying in one of the cages. Guys, you recognize that one? He asked. Why are they selling an old bit of wood? Isaiah asked. I think that old bit of wood might be Gustafsson's friend. Anyone remember his name? Hey, Twiggy Iggy, Rick called. The dormant log sprang to life. Master's associate, where is the master? He asked. Dunno, you sniff him up the wrong way or something? How'd you get here? Ignacio explained the Battle of Manx and Cove, although he only knew the very beginning of it. We must hurry back at once. What if Miss Azumi is in danger? Watson said. Well, they ain't here at the market, so clearly it didn't go all that bad, Nuke reasoned. But yeah, forget the cocktails and tanning, let's just get out of here. Everyone go wait outside, I'll deal with the situation here. Getting his meaning, the group went to go make a scene over by the front gate. They hadn't actually intended to make a scene, 
but Els had asked Rick if skeletons could have babies, and the debate proved far more contentious than expected. Let me tell you all about the old 0101, Rick began. Enraptured, the guards didn't notice Nuke opening Ignacio's cage in the middle of the marketplace. The hiver was one leg short of a full complement, so Nuke shouldered him like the lumberjacks of old and made a run for it. Everyone scarpered post-haste and buggered off eastwards into the beginnings of the legendary drug canyon. Going home via this route meant they wandered right past the little farm where Azumi and company were hiding. Azumi flagged Nuke down from the roof of the bar and rushed outside for the sweet reunion. Where the fuck have you been? She screamed at him. Well, I suppose it wasn't so sweet. All right, just been learning up a few things. Did you know that this symbol on the front here means perverted? Nuke said, brandishing a heavily annotated copy of a priceless ancient classic. You, we nearly died. We got royally fugged, Nuke. Heard about the slavers. Look, we got the Bogman back. This is serious. It's far more than slavers. We don't know if Jazz is alive. We left her behind. And I thought something had happened to you as well, since you didn't come back. Ogren's blood. I just... Future girl, I'm sorry, Nuke said, putting a hand on her shoulder. Man, I'm sorry, okay? I'm gonna sort this out. Bad Green, got your man here. Gustafsson nodded to Ignacio, who nodded back from across Nuke's shoulders. Gary's got all the goods, and you guys are still alive, so this ain't so bad, right? Although, Sandor looks kinda different. Anulfo was standing behind Azumi. Oh, your ninja man went on ahead to check out your farm, I understand, he said. I'm Arnie, grower, shower, brown town goer. It's not really what it sounds like, Izumi assured everyone. Arnulfo joined the group on the walk further down the canyon towards the HQ, a walk that increasingly becomes a wade as the ground gets swampier on the approach to the sacred cove. Sandor waved them in once they got close. The wall still stood tall, some of Nuke's troops were patched up and patrolling the surrounding hills, and the corpses had been mostly harvested and tidied away. They went inside, where Nuke had a much sweeter reunion with his loyal crabs, and at last, the guild was back in action. All in all, after all that chaos and fighting, their only loss had been half of Ignacio's leg, which when compared to what happened to the raiders, was certainly the better way to come out of all that. Right, so I'm never leaving you lot in charge of anything, ever again, Nuke stated. It was your girlfriend in charge, so it's all her fault, Jazz said. Yeah, she gets a free strike since she's my personal historian. Is that what the kids are calling it nowadays? No, they call it Etchy Sketch. What? It's a reference to the classics, don't worry, Izumi assured her old friend. So, Prince, you did bring the chocolate beans. Yeah, I got the beans, baby, Nuke said, flipping over Gary's pack, digging through the crusty books, and dragging out a huge sack. Brown Town, you're up. Arnulfo took a look at the beans, gave a few a good, repeated lick, making sure to look each person present in the eye as he did so, and then he finally concluded, It's perfect! These'll grow in your mank like crotch rot and taste twice as good. And so, with this professional opinion reeling in the guild's minds, work began on Old Farmer Nuke's ancient ranch. The coincidental yet resounding victory at the Battle of Manx and Cove brought them a good fortnight of peace and quiet, and allowed them to freely bring everything they needed down from Black Scratch. After a few days, Azumi's co-workers had set up an office for her in the corner of the compound, perfect for the close study of this increasingly famous mank that the chocolate was growing in. Yes, that is the scientific term for it. It stands for mushy and nutritious crap. This crap was long known to the tech hunters. The First Empire had used certain fertilizers to grow crops on the planet's half-baked land, and there were patches of it still stewing away in the ground today. Combined with the fact that the chocolate beans had been fiddled with thousands of years back to make them grow practically overnight, the first crops of fresh brown were piled up by Arnie after just a couple of days. Growing crops is easy, my man, Nuke commented to Wadston. What was all that stuff with the Red Rebellion about then? 
While I am no expert, my prince, I believe that not everyone has equal access to the wondrous mank that we do, Watchton said. Not to mention the bandits, Isaiah added. I mean, not every farmer has walls and sword arms like ours when the hungry crabs come calling, you know. Or the government samurai, Sandor added. Yeah, yeah, I get it. People just need to get energized and farm that shit like us. Chocolate gives you energy, right? Yeah, we'll dose everyone up with brown and turn this damn planet green with our own hands. Then I really will be the green emperor. <laughs> I'll inspire the people to have courage in the face of this miserable shitstorm we call life. Get them cocky with the chocky and we'll be over the moons. Leaving everyone to debate Els's interpretation of getting cocky with Chalky and to fight furiously to prevent a demonstration, Nuke went to Azumi's office. She was slaving away at a desk covered in books in varying degrees of completion. Milady, Nuke said as he entered. Not yours, shot back the reply. Uh, let's check the contract on that one. Anyway, people are saying... I don't care what they're saying, we're not an item! Uh... So yeah, people are saying they don't know what to do next with the chocolate. Cocky, chocky. Oh, right, sorry, I, uh, did I say, oh, hello, Nuke Prince, uh, didn't see you. Something on your mind? Not in the slightest. <laughs> yes, chocolate, the cocky chocolate, wait, what the fuck? Just testing the waters. Narcos laughter. So, chocolate, yeah, it's sugar, water, cocoa. We need to get Julian to make a machine. Might have to shop around for the parts. Another walk for me, is it? No, Izumi said, jumping around to face Nuke. Fine, calm down. Don't go again, Nuke. It was no good. I messed up. You didn't mess up. Everyone except you messed up, you know? Kind of you to say that. Kind of weird to disagree. This is happening because of you. With your brains and my brawn, we'll get a whole lot of people addicted to drugs. That's a dream we can believe in. Future... girl? Zumi was ruining the mood by tearing up. I thought someone was gonna die because of me. I thought I would die. I don't know how you'd do it, Nuke. Nuke, the true gentleman of the Third Empire, awkwardly went in for something resembling a hug. It's... I guess I'd just keep going, since even if we don't make it all the way, that doesn't matter, does it? That's not the world we live in, or whatever. What matters is what we're doing, like right now. Making things better and being... around. I do like it, Nuke. Being together. Tragically, Red Rick wasn't sitting in the corner for a well-timed heckle, so Nuke had to actually think of a response. That's convenient, isn't it? Was his eventual effort. It landed better than you'd think, but the stilted nature of the phrase seemed to restore reality. The hug-like pose was quickly disengaged, and Nuke marched out. Chocolate machine then, thanks future girl, he called without looking back. Glad to be of service, Prince Tashino, Izumi almost shouted, before slumping down in her chair and collapsing onto her pile of papers. A week of hard labours passed featuring the planting of sugarcane, wheat and soybeans for Azumi's master plan, and the construction of a large factory building to house the chocolate-making gear. Arnulfo had been given a team of likely lads and lasses from nearby cities to form his workforce, and together they had got Mike Sand Cove pumping out produce as fast as elves could fertilize it. The sugarcane was stripped and ground into sugar. The soybeans were pressed and pureed into milk and the cocoa was shredded and compounded with the sugar to make disgusting, acidic lumps of pure chocolate. It was brown, all right, but only the crabs could stomach eating it. That was where Izumi's master recipe came in. The wheat was crushed into flour, mixed with the soy milk, and then cooked in a huge outdoor oven, creating a delightfully wobbly yet infuriatingly sticky white mush. Remember, mush Moderately unpleasant slop hulk should never be confused with mank. The chocolate could be mixed into the mush to make somewhat likeable uncooked dough gunk extract, which when cooked created the most wonderful, soft, fluffy, sweet, filling... John Fuggin' crabs coming in hot from the east! Red Rick shouted from the wall. 
A slave raid arriving from the west. Close the gate! Watson reported from atop the factory roof. Yes, if you think things were getting a little bit too domestic in Nuke's corner of the world, you're forgetting just how popular this soggy corner was. The guild's crew rushed to defend the main gateway and man the walls. Since the time of the Great Battle, the fortifications had been extended and fitted with electric harpoon guns. Gustafsson was an expert with the design and operation of these weapons, and had kindly instructed all of the new farmhands how to use them. Therefore, when a crowd of crabs, traffickers, and crab traffickers charged the compound gate, a barrage of bolts and spears spat down at them from the walls. The crabbers weren't too fussed, with both man and beast covered in armor. Snippy, snippy, claw, claw, snippy, claw, claw. They chanted as they smashed at the front gate. Some of the crabs helped bend the bars apart to let their masters inside, but others were distracted by the gang of slavers milling about behind them. There is a bloody queue to raid this damn farm, a slaver complained. The slaven infrastructure around here is terrible. They should have a second gate to reduce wait times, another commented. Everyone nodded along in agreement. However, they soon encountered a slight problem. The consortium of crabs in front of them had been promised some dirty humans to snip in half, and the slavers certainly looked dirty and human enough. Snippy, snippy, claw, claw, the poor old slavers were no more. Still, the delay meant that a lot more sharp misc was cast down before the gateway, and by the time the gate was properly torn open, the crab crew was too injured to make it past Nuke and company waiting on the other side, especially when Prince was joined by the now adult-sized Krusty and Scut, forming an impenetrable wall of crab mightier than any steel gate or array of harpoon cannons. I told you, Fugs, I don't need a crabbing permit! Nuke called as battle was joined. Crabless ones who actually do have crabs. Now that's even worse, a crabber reasoned. Fortunately, the guild was now able to slay the invaders without any casualties and get to work bending the gate back into shape. In one curious incident, Azaya thrust his katana right through a crabber's armor, but when he pulled it back out, the blade was covered in something brown and sticky. Ocran's might! You really should try emptying yourself out now and again, he said as he winced. It's only chocolate, were the crabber's last words as he fell. Els was called up to perform further inspection, and indeed the crabber had stuffed his armor with chocolate, pilfered from an overturned wheelbarrow. So, the fishman fathers like Chocky, Nuke said. That's a good sign. If it turns out no one can stomach the stuff, we'll convert this place to a crab ranch and lure all those weirdos into their doom. Take their crabs and raise them as our own. In a uh, not weird kind of way. Not weird at all, Izumi said. But don't worry, we'll do just fine with the chocolate bread, I assure you. Ah yes, the bread. As I was saying, one turns mank into mush, mush into sludge, and sludge into the most joyous and sweet food stuff to grace the land since sliced sand cakes. It was like bread, but with a moorish tang and a sugary softness. The greatest invention of all time, except the time it was invented before, the official Nuke Tashino High Quality Mouth Pro Edible Adventuring Loaf Version 2 Sweet as the Manx Sand Canyon Wind on a Summer's Day Edition. Or, Nuke said, for short, brown bread. He held up a yellowish-brown loaf before the assembled guild. I think that name might be taken, Wadsden said, but his voice must have been carried away on the Manx Sand Canyon wind, for it went unheard. Thanks to the hard work of Brown Town and his horrible team of dregs, we have manufactured 100 lumps of the new wonder drug. But the proof is made of pudding or something, and that is why it is time to test the markets. All non-disgusting guild members and Charlie will be coming with me on a little sales tour. Rest of you dirty mank scratching types, you keep mining for chocolate or whatever and get this bread. While I'm gone, the crabs are in charge, got it? The confused grumbling was taken as a yes. With this, the guild was back on track for adventure, with Gary loaded up with the new wonder drug. 
Would brown bread take the world by storm? Well, perhaps that is the wrong question. If we are to take Nuke's view of things, it didn't matter, did it? A nice trip to deal an as yet unbanned drug was good enough to enjoy no matter the result, especially with his good friends and associates to share it with. Back on the road, with Starter Chocolate Factory ticked off his bucket list, Nuke began a new brown bread adventure. Oh, look at that, they're being mauled by a beak thing. Yep, that's pretty much how this adventure's going to go, isn't it?